today as we continue our uh, study on the book of James and uh, today's topic is going to be pride and jealousy and we are going to look from uh, chapter 4 verses 1 to 10 and uh, it says where do wars and fights come from among you do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members you lust and do not have you murder and covet and cannot obtain you fight and war yet you do not have because you do not ask you ask and do not receive because you ask a mess that you may spend in your own pleasures adulteress and adulteresses do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with god whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of god or do you think that the scripture says in vain the spirit who dwells in us earns jealousy but he gives more grace therefore he says god resists the proud but gives grace to the humble therefore submit to god resist the devil and he will flee from you draw near to god he will draw near to you cleanse your hands you sinners purify your hearts you double minded lament and mourn and weep let your laughter laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom humble yourselves in the sight of the lord and he will lift you up amen as we've been uh, studying this uh, book for quite a few weeks now and we have come to a uh, another important place which is pride and jealousy uh, in some form we all have got uh, the element of pride in us and we are also have uh, some element of uh, jealousy which we need to avoid um, maybe some of us have been delivered completely from uh, jealousy. We do not cover it uh, in other, other, like someone else, in a degree, in a perception way. But then we all have got a pride in ourselves. We pride in everything. Whether we know it or not, we do. So we need to constantly check ourselves and then we need to keep removing it's like every day we have a shower so we cleanse ourselves the same way there has got to be a, a spiritual cleansing of look for any traces of pride comes in because as we may have we may think we are not prideful but it comes in and it it comes in us in a very very subtle way you know when people come and appreciate uh, maybe you are very good in cooking people come and say wow it's so good so if they keep saying for three four times then you start thinking ah when i make that tea or when i make cook that one no one can beat it okay everyone likes it so then it becomes a, a problem the same way even in spiritual life you know maybe you are a good worship leader then again a problem. Maybe you are a very good musician, then again a problem. Maybe you are a good preacher, again it's a problem. So everything, uh, every little thing what we do, we end up uh, showing that I am somebody. That pride comes in us, it is in us. That is what he is trying to say, that we need to be humble and also we need to avoid jealousy. As we all know, this letter was written to the scattered Christians from Jerusalem to everywhere. They are all going and living everywhere with any, every other believers or non-believers in the world they are in. So they are facing a lot of problems. They are facing a lot of um, issues. To them, he is writing to them that do not be prideful. And when it comes to the first uh, the verse one on chapter four it says what is causing the quarrels and fights among you isn't it because 
there is a whole army of evil desires within you. So, I put it from the New Living Translation, the old New Living Translation. He says, there is an army inside of you. <laughs> there is a whole army inside of you and that is always um, raises so many evil desires within you and there has been a fight is going on. You wanted, you want to do something or you lust after it and you are looking for something. You know, the covetousness uh, which, uh, you know, in the old covenant what uh, the Lord has commanded them, which they were not able to keep up. In the old covenant, out of 10 commandments, they can keep all the 9 commandments and they can be say, yes, I'm keeping all the commandments. But the 10th commandment, it is uh, your heart's attitude. If you see in uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, it says, I think it's there in the page number 3, he gives the commandment, he says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his um, male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So if I have to put it on a 21st century translation, do not cover your neighbor's mobile phone, do not cover your neighbor's you know, uh, car or his house or his lawn or his dress or his handbag or his suit, you know, something like that, you know. Um, Maybe that's what it is today. Those days they had a bigger transport as ox and donkey. So he was talking about it. But today, in the modern day, we all have that problem. In the old covenant, they were not able to keep, uh, they couldn't keep themselves. That's why when Apostle Paul writes a letter to Romans, he says the struggles which he went through in chapter 7 and he come, he finishes that, you know, I don't want to do certain things, I end up doing it. And the same way, I, I want to do something which I could not do it. It's not that I'm I'm uh, this one, but the sin which is in me, the, the things which is in me are making me to do all this kind of a thing. And then he completes it, who can save a wretched man like me? And then he says, thanks be to God in Christ Jesus, I am saved. So it is in the old covenant, they cannot keep the law, but in the new covenant, we can because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So we have to make that very clear. In the old covenant, they were not able to keep that covetousness. They are not, you know, uh, they are jealous of something. But in the new covenant, we should be able to because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In um, verse 2, in chapter 4, James 4, 2, it says, You want what you don't have, so you kill to get it. You long for what others have, and can't afford it, so you start a fight to take away from them. And yet, the reason you don't have what you want is that you don't ask God for it. He says, okay, you don't have it, but you want it. So what is the solution? You kill. You, you do something, you murder somebody, or you kill something, or you plan something, and then you get that because you don't go and ask God for it. So anything what we need, it is we need to ask God rather than trying to do with our own strength. Because when he talks about the other translation, talks about the, the lust of the eyes. You see, most of our uh, learning comes through our eyes and, and our ears. Um, almost about uh, close to 90% of our learning comes through our eyes. Uh, only 10% we learn through our ears, rest everything through our eyes. We watch people. That's how the children, when they grow up, they look at how mom is doing or the dad is doing and then they, okay, this is how it should be done. This is how it should be done. Everything, whether good or bad, either smoking or drinking or doing the right things, wrong things, they always look at it okay, this is how, okay, this is how it should be done. So they learn. We also learn the same way. So the lust of the eyes, through our eyes, we make, uh, we learn so many things. 
So we have to be very careful about what we see. In Jesus says in Matthew 6, he says, your eye is the lamp unto the body. If your eye is good, your whole body is good. So such a distinction he makes. Jesus, when in John, Matthew 6, he says, very clearly he says, so the lust of the eyes, when we have that thing in our eyes, then what happens is we try to get what we want instead of asking God for it. One of the clear example is Adam and Eve. God told them, you can have eat anything except this tree. But what they do, they end up eating. The reason is, in Genesis 3, 6 says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from it its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. So it is, she saw it was good. It was very inviting. She went and she took it. She listened to the serpent. Instead, she waited and asked God and God would have given it. That is his plan, eternal life. But the only thing is he wanted them to obey. But then they, she did not and she took it on her own. This is why, you know, even in the old covenant, they were not able to keep the Ten Commandments because the Ten Commandments was designed so that they will lean on God, not on themselves. That's an idea behind it. And also today, you see the society where we live in, the lust of the eye is the primary thing. Every advertisement focus on what you don't have, what you have is not good enough. What we have got is the best. So you got an iPhone uh, 5, you have got iPhone 6. Okay, you got iPhone 6, you have got 6S. Okay, you got Samsung 6, we have got Samsung 7. Every time you see every model, everything, it's always, they say, okay, we have got a better speed. Now it, it can run. Like in the automotive, they say, okay, 0 to 60 miles in 0.7 seconds. Not 0.8 seconds, it is 0.7 seconds. In practically where we can go from 0 to 60 miles in this country or in any country. We are not in a such a hurry. Imagine, we don't have such a roads. We don't have such a thing. We are not running a racetrack. But that's how they promote it. And we also, wow, this goes in six, six seconds. This goes in seven seconds. Now this electric car, Telstra, they, they brought in a version called 306. And that goes much faster. So the other day my son was saying, that that's super car, you know, they, they made it so beautiful. I said, yeah, I also saw that. So everything, it's always, they try to show that what they have got is best, what you have got is inferior. That's only one line. You can finish every advertisement you see. And also you see the amount of um, the way they use women to sell products. What does a naked woman has to do with selling a car? What is a naked woman to sell to, to sell a cool ring? There's no, there is absolutely no connection. For a male's perfume, for a male's body, uh, this one, you are stinking, that's why they are selling a body odor. You know, something so that you, you know, you can be, feel fresh. Even in that, they use women. You know, as soon as you put that, there are some girls are running away and you like. So they make it so enticing that, you know, you have to have this, then only you will be better, you will you will look better, you will look nice, you, you will have a social standing, you will have a good status, like, you know, that's the only way they are always advertising and they are always, you know, put the hook and then get you on. Once you got, that's it, you are like a fish on the hook, so you can never escape. Satan did the same thing with Jesus Christ. When he came to Jesus, he also did. He took him on the mountain top and then he showed the entire earth and its glory and everything. And then he says, I will give you all this. So you don't have to go through that route. You just see this. Everything you can get, you can worship me in private. That's what he was trying to do. So we have to be very, very uh, careful in that. So James is saying, 
you don't have it because you don't go and ask God for it. That's what in verse 2 he says. But when he goes to verse 3, he says, and even when you do ask, you don't get it because your whole aim is wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. He says, okay, everything, whatever you want, you go to God. Okay. And then he says, even when you go to God, sometimes you go to God, you don't get it. Why you don't get it? Because your whole aim is to please yourself or have the worldly pleasures. You are, you are going to use it for your own pleasure. That is why you are not having it. Because you are not, um, you know, your whole aim is to please you. It's not to please God. See, time and again, we, you know, the letter asks us to examine us. You know, this has been a very challenging uh, lesson, what we have been going through. Right from the introduction, humility, every subject, you see, humility, trials, wisdom, temptations, and, uh, you know, the hearing the word, not doing it, and so uh, perspective, and every lesson, it is a very, very challenging lesson. So he is talking to the uh, the believers that it is not what you act out, but it's about the internal matter, that how the old covenant they were not able to keep out because it's a matter of heart. The same way, since you have got the Holy Spirit inside of you, you search your heart and you have your inner life cleaned out, not just try to empty outside life. As Jesus says, you know, empty whitewashed tombs, you know, not... Anyhow, it's a dead bone inside. What is the point in, you know, white was tombs? So that's what J James is trying to drive this uh, letter through these people. And also, you see, the, when it comes to using it, your aim is for yourself. When Jesus was uh, tempted, and every temptation, Jesus overcame by the word of God. And quoting it, it is written. It is also written. So if he didn't use his power or his anointing for his personal gain. If he had turned the stone into bread, no, there is no commandment that he cannot make it. But he didn't do it because he didn't want to use it for himself. That is why he said no. So every time he overcame by the word of God. In verse 4 he says, you are like an unfaithful wife. So I put this version. You know, rather than uh, you adulterer or an adulteresses, which is there in uh, NKJV or NASB or NAV, whatever you read. But this uh, NLT is so good. It says, you know, you are like an unfaithful wife who loves her husband's enemies. <laughs> That's a nice way to put it across, no? <laughs> you are an unfaithful wife. How? You love his enemies. Eh? Don't you realize that making friends with God's enemies the evil pleasures of this world makes you an enemy of God. I say it again, that if your aim is to enjoy the evil pleasures of the unsaved world, you cannot also be a friend of God. So again, he comes across, he says, if your aim is to enjoy the evil pleasures of the unsaved world. So where is your aim? That's what he is trying to drive it. You don't have it because you are not asking for it. If you ask it, still you are not getting it because your aim is wrong. So he goes on to say, okay, you are an unfaithful, you are like an unfaithful wife. What you are trying to do, you are trying to please, uh, you are trying to love your husband's enemies. That is like you are committed to God, whereas you are loving the world. That's what he is saying. As uh, when Paul writes to Corinthians in uh, 2 Corinthians 11, chapter 11, verse 1, he says, I have betrothed you to one husband. So as a Christian, we are betrothed to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are in a relationship and he has gone to prepare a house for us. We have to be faithful to him. Whereas, we will be unfaithful if we are going to love the world and worldly pleasures, not his will. You know, one of the analogy I used some time back, you know, it's like uh, uh, now that we are living in Britain, 
and uh, the many of our soldiers went to Iraq and uh, you know Syria and all these places we know. Imagine uh, uh, a soldier who is uh, engaged to be a, engaged to a woman to get married and then he goes to war and then uh, he there he goes and every time he carries uh, your photograph and he sits there and goes through all the troubles and everything and then to surprise her he comes <coughs> when he finishes job and then he comes back and then he finds it that uh, the his girlfriend has been going around daily with somebody to the uh, local pub and then the day he comes and she's gone out for a drink and then overnight stay with some other one of uh, the one of his enemies and he is sleeping with her how will he find out how will he feel about it exactly that's what god will feel about it so we loving the world and worldly pleasures that means we are not going to please the one who has gone away to prepare a place for us so we got to be remain faithful to him that's why he says if you are faithful to God, then you will be definitely enemy to the world. You will not love the world and its pleasures. You will be loving the one who has gone to get a place for you. So you got to be faithful. That's that's a point he is writing there. And he is saying that where is your aim? It's to please God or to please yourself. It's the same apostle John also goes on to this theme very well in his letter. In First John chapter 2 verse 15 to 17 he says, do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. So we need to understand one thing very clearly whatever we see on this earth the car the house the spouse the children anything what you see on this earth everything is temporary everything this mic this light this camera everything is temporary but what is eternal is god and our eternal life so we need to realize and we need to value that once we have that value, the perspective right, then our aim will be to please God. Our aim will be towards the eternal life, not the earthly one. We will not be going around pleasing the world and worldly lusts. That's what he is saying. So the next he goes on to, as we read from the uh, initial, from goes on to <coughs> talks about the pride. He says, you know, God gives more grace, therefore he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So pride is the one, God is against it. So let's look at what is pride. The origin of sin that we know that it is took place, not on the Garden of Eden, but it took place in, in the heaven, which is recorded in Isaiah chapter 14 verses 12 to 15 that you will find also in Ezekiel uh, 28. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, he didn't say open in his mouth, he said in his heart. You said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, the lowest depths of the pit. You see how many times I comes in, I will, five times it comes. He says, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. I will also sit. I will ascend above. I will be like the most high. So, Satan rebelled against God because of pride. So, 
pride is the one we need to guard ourselves. <coughs> because of the pride of the Satan, he and his one third of the angels were cast down and they, that's where the whole problem is come through. And I also written from what uh, the Paradise Lost, the fictional story by John Milton that how, you know, he was unwilling to worship God in heaven and wanting to be like his place, he begins to a rebellion. It says, better be, better to rule in hell than serve in heaven. <laughs> you know, how pride comes. You know, I, I um, there is a saying in Tamil, I don't know how, how, how you can uh, understand it. It's a saying in Tamil is there, you know, I will be a head of a, and then being a tail of an elephant. <laughs> there are a lot of people say that, you know. Uh, it's better to be a head of an ant than a tail of an elephant. Something like that. He says, better to rule hell than serve in heaven. So it was the pride that root cause for his rebellion. He wanted to rule. He wanted to sit in the most high. He wanted to be the center of attention. So... This is where the pride becomes a root of all evil. You know, he is, the pride is the one which drove him. So what is the first sin of the world? In the world, it is Adam and Eve. Even there also, you see the disobedience. It's only because of that identity crisis. All he said is, if you are. So that's where it costed. The other one is, in the sin wise, if you look at it, there is a two ways we can look at. One is Adam's sin, other one is Cain's sin. Adam's sin costed his life, Cain's sin costed somebody else's life. There are sin which will you will have a consequences because of pride and the sin comes in. That has two sides of it. One, the sin affects me. The other one, because of my sin, somebody else gets affected. That's where you, that's what you can learn from Adam's sin and also from the sin of Cain. You know, but, you know the story how Cain went and killed Abel because of his sin that he killed someone else. So James says in chapter 3 verse 16, he says, For wherever there is a jealous, jealousy and selfish ambition, there will be there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. If you remember, after verse 17, the verse starts from here. When his letter, this is what the previous uh, lines in his letter, what we are looking at chapter 4, verses 1 to 10, we are looking, the previous two, and then he talks about the wisdom from above and the earthly wisdom. Just one verse before that, he says this. So wherever there is a jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. So take an uh, introspection of your life. What are the sins that affect you only? I'm sure there are many for us. You know, we do commit a lot of sins knowingly or unknowingly. So that comes under Adam's sin category. There are sins which affects others also. That comes under the category of Cain. So I did put an example here. So if I have a, uh, if I have two boys, say one person beats up the other. So usually the elder one, younger one beats up the older one, not the other way. <laughs> So when you go and uh, definitely I will intervene and then I will try to involve and then I have to do something about it. If I don't do anything about it, then I don't love them. So the same way God has to do something about it. So when we do something which affects somebody, then God has to intervene. So just to avoid that, that's why he says God resists the proud. The pride comes in, the pride brings in kind of a sin. That sin, like sin of Cain, that sin affects somebody. So then I am 
I'm directly working against God and God is working against me. So I am uh, direct in contradicting with God. But God gives me grace when I humble myself. So the pride, I have to watch out on the pride. So because the pride is the one who led me to sin, so I have to remove the pride from my life. How can I remove the pride from my life? I've given three points. It's a very big subject, but little bit we can look at it. One is prayer. One is ask God to help you and also pray with others. You know, uh, you have to have freedom with very close friends of yours where they will be able to express freely what you are doing is wrong when you do wrong. If you don't have that kind of a, a fellowship, then you may not be able to identify the prideful nature of yours. Because someone has to pull you up and say, I'm sorry, that's a very arrogant statement. What you did is not right. So that, that much of accountability we need to have. That we need to pray with somebody and we need to say, okay, this is what I am feeling. This is what I am trying to do. How could I do? What can I do? So that way you will be able to be accountable in one way. Second is acknowledging that you are a sinner. The pride comes the moment you think that you deserve something. The self-righteousness comes. By, even though by, by through and through we believe by grace alone we have saved, and as we saw in the last lesson, that how, you know, we are not only hearer, we are doer of the word. Just because we are doing something, then slowly the self-righteousness comes. God loves me because I am doing so and so many things. You know, God must be pleased with me. You know, I am reading my Bible. You know, God must be very happy that I am reading. God must be very happy, you know, I am praying. God must be very happy that I am going to church. So suddenly what happens is you start serving, you will tend to think, God must be very pleased, you know that. You know, I'm going, you know, I'm doing so many things. So that creeps in without we realize. So that's why we all should realize we are all sinners. None of us, none of us can go stand before God. You know, you see the um, Luke 18, 13, God be merciful to me, the sinner. The tax collector and the Pharisee, they go to pray. The Pharisee, looking at the tax collector, hey, I'm not like him. Today, you and me become like a Pharisee when someone else walks in. You know how it will be? Uh, say, for example, we all know somebody who's really bad, okay? Say, for example, we take so-and-so. He is the worst uh, sinner we know. Like he is a drunkard. He gets drunk and then he gets uh, caught up with the women and everything. And then uh, you, we all know we went and rescued him and we helped him and everything. When he comes to the church, when he walks to pray and you stand to pray and when he starts praying, you will certainly look down on him. I bet you will definitely. Look at this guy, yeah? he is coming and praying. It, it comes to us. It will. It will pass. We all have that. That's what exactly the Pharisee did. Yeah, I am not like him. You know, I pray, I fast, I do everything. Whereas look at this guy. That's what he did. But he, guy, he was praying, God be merciful to me, the sinner. The second one is, he who says he has no sin is deceived. First John 1 John 1.8. So we, none of us can say, I am a very clean person. We are all in the process. The sanctification is an on, ongoing process. We are being sanctified until we are going to be with the Lord or until the God comes. So every day of our life, we need the mercy of God. We need the grace of God. And we should never forget that it is who God's grace we have been saved and we should never uh, take a low of the awe of God of in our life.
And thirdly, always boast in God. To be humble, you need to boast in God. Not boasting in anything, boast in God. I have achieved. I have done this. I, if I preach, oh, okay, you know what will happen. Or if I pray, you know, the heaven shakes, brother. If I worship, no. Always boast in God. God used me. You know, the last Sunday service, one of the songs we were singing, Aliyum Udadhulai Kondu, Aliyah the Rajim Katta, Yatana Irundi, and Nathir in the Rathir. It is, you know, my, I'm a uh, sinful lips of this, which is decaying sinful lips. But you use this lips to proclaim the everlasting kingdom. I was like a Jacob, but yet you taken and used me. That's a wonderful way to boast about God. Apostle Paul is a wonderful example. He says, it is by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me is not in vain, but I labored among more abundantly than all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. That's a wonderful way to acknowledge it. That's in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. And again, when he writes to Romans, he says, Romans chapter 15, verse 18 and 19. Yet I did not boast about anything except what Christ has done through me. That's the way that we should be able to boast about bringing the Gentiles to God by my message and by the way I worked among them, they were convinced by the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's Spirit. In this way, I have fully presented the good news of Christ from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum. So, it is, we need to always acknowledge and always boast it is by the grace of God we are able to do it. We are able to do. So when we do all these three things, one is praying with others and secondly, you know, acknowledging that I am a sinner but yet God used me and then boasting in God that it is God who has done this thing that will make you to keep humble. And then he goes on to say there are certain things you need to do to cleanse yourself so that you can be humble when you humble yourself, God will exalt you. So, let me read this verses from 7 to 10. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. So here he goes on to say uh, 10 things. I've listed 10 things. Each subject, each topic, I, we can do a sermon, but I'm not going to do that. I'll just, you know, go through, you know, one liner or two liner and maybe you can do it later. One is submitting to God. We do say that, yes, Lord, I surrender. I surrender all. As soon as the song is over, we pick it up. So, submitting to God and everything. Submitting every plan, everything. Your, either you are concerning your family, concerning your ministry, concerning your money, everything you need to submit to God. Second is, resist the devil. Every time when Jesus is the finest example, we saw the uh, temptations of Jesus Christ. And even in his every day, he resisted him. So he has to flee. When you resist, he will flee. And then third is, draw near to God. Why we need to draw near to God? We, our aim is to please him. So we need to draw near to him. And his assurances in, the charm, in verse 4, when you draw near to him, he will draw nearer to you. So when you take one step, he takes about 10 steps. That's how God is. So it is very important that we draw closer to him so that we will be able to walk with him. And then fourth, cleanse your hands. Clean your hands. What is clean your hands? We do clean every day. You know, when we eat, we clean. <laughs> no, it's not. You know, there are many sins we commit through our hands. That's what cleanse your hands means. There are many sins we commit using our hands. 
So those, he is saying, okay, you clean your hands, use your hands to do godly things. Don't do ungodly things. There are certain physical things which you need to do, you do that. But don't do some of the other things. Cleanse, clean hands. Um, it is a saying also in, uh, uh, he's a clean hands. So that means he is not involved in any hanky-panky business. He's a very clean guy. You know, it's his, his life is very clean. That's what it is. Purify your hearts. In the old covenant, you don't find a commandments like this. In the New Testament, you find the commandments like this. Because you have got the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you can purify your hearts. Those who are pure in your hearts will see the kingdom of God. So we got to be pure. Um, as Hebrew uh, 12, Hebrew chapter 13, verse 6, he says, Without holiness, no man can see the Lord. Hebrews 12, yeah. He says, without holiness, no man can see the Lord. So the same way, we have to purify our hearts. And then sixth one is, don't be double-minded. That he says in, in chapter 1 also, James says, when you ask for a wisdom, do not be doubting. Do not be double-minded. Believe that he will give you. Here also he says, don't be double-minded. You Whether you want to please the world or God, no. Make a decision. My life is to only to please God. That's it. No two point about it. And then he says, weep and mourn. It is, um, uh, be joyful, be rejoice. Again I say rejoice. Yes, it is true. But we have to weep about ourselves, the way we are in. God help me. You know, when uh, Apostle Paul says, wretched man I am. He, he says, so when you have come to know that our shortfalls, then we will tend to cry out when we tend to do that. And then pray. As we saw that, you know, get rid of this one, prayer. And finally, he says, nine, he says, humble yourselves. Humbling yourselves, humility. We saw from James when the first lesson we saw, how be humble. How to be? How hum, we have to be? Uh, we have to have the humility. So he says again, humble yourself so that God will lift you up. And then finally he says, forsake the pleasures. You know, the forsaking the pleasures of this world is, is it is a challenge. You know, like uh, how as more and more uh, gadgets have been <coughs> invented, the more and more uh, things are made in this world to make you very comfortable to be this one. The Wi-Fi or the infrared or the things which has been created, everything remote control today. You don't have to even to use the keys. You do, everything, it's all uh, remote control. Uh, what, are the, what are the things that in... So 20, 30 years, people used to work hard. Like we see a grinder, we have a mixer, we have a juicer, everything, the gas, everything, it has so many things, a microwave, everything. It's It has made us so, so uh, comfortable. You know, you sit in your chair, there is a, a lumberjack, it goes around, it massages you. So the yeah, today the travel, those days travel used to be a misery. But these days, travels are so comfortable. It is so enjoyable. So it is a pleasure. And forsaking them and seeking God is a challenge. So he says, you take time to forsake them. You can live comfortably. In this country, we, you know, if you don't do anything, nobody is going to bother you. You can just live comfortably. You can live peacefully. No problem. Absolutely, he can live, eat, die. He can eat, live, die and go. No one will do this one. But can you make your life count? So you have to go out of the, your comfort zone. So that's why he says, forsake the pleasures. So I would request you to examine yourselves deeply by the help of the Holy Spirit so that the Spirit of God can reveal to you what is inside of you so that you can change yourself. 
no no one can you know we can't make you to change but god can help you to change so when you do that so he will be able to help us so let us all draw nearer to him so near to him so he will draw nearer to us that's a promise he has given us so i pray that you know as we take time to remove the pride and the jealousy from us as i put it in the first picture pride the greatest sin of all you know jesus christ preached about one sin very vehemently it is pride the primary thing he addressed the one sin he addressed is sin is pride that's a top most sin he preached while he was on the earth the bible says pride is the biggest sin of all so i pray that you know god will help us to eliminate that so we'll be able to be humble and let the people look at us let them see the humility in us so that you know as we started in chapter 1 how humble he was so we pray that god will give us that humility we we'll, in humble in humility will draw closer to him so he will draw closer to us Thanks.